We'll take you live to Ottawa now, where Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie and Immigration Minister Mark Miller are giving an update on the situation with India. Let's see if they also answer any questions about the war in the Middle East. We'll begin with some opening remarks from the ministers. We will turn to the floor for questions, and if we have time, we will go to the considerable list of people who are online. With that, over to you, ministers. Thank you. Thank you. Je vais commencer en anglais et après j'irai en français. Good afternoon. I'm here with you today along with uh, my colleague and friend, Minister Miller, dear Mark. Um, as of now, I can confirm that India has formally conveyed its plan to unilaterally remove diplomatic immunities for all but 21 Canadian diplomats and dependents in Delhi by tomorrow, October 20th. This means 41 Canadian diplomats and their 42 dependents were in danger of having immunity stripped on an arbitrary date, and this would put their personal safety at risk. The safety of Canadians and of our diplomats is always my top concern. Given the implications of India's actions on the safety of our diplomats, we have facilitated their safe departure from India. This means that our diplomats and their families have now left. Diplomatic immunities keep diplomats safe, no matter where they're from and where they're sent to. Immunities allow diplomats to do their work without fear of reprisal or arrest from the country they're in. They are a fundamental, fundamental principle of diplomacy. And this is a two-way street. The only work, they only work if every country abides by the rules. A unilateral revocation of diplomatic privileges and immunities is contrary to international law. It is a clear violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And threatening to do so is unreasonable and escalatory. If we allow the norm of diplomatic immunity to be broken, no diplomats anywhere on the planet would be safe. So for this reason, we will not reciprocate. Canadians watching may be wondering what this means for our operations in India. There's no question that India's decision will impact levels of services to citizens in both countries. Unfortunately, we have to put a pause on all in-person services in our consulates in Chandigarh, in Mumbai, and in Bangalore. And I will let my colleagues speak uh, for what that means for immigration services, but also for consular services. Canadians who need consular assistance can still visit our High Commission in Delhi, and you can still also do that in person, reach by phone and by email. Let me be clear. Canada will continue to defend international law, which applies to all nations, and will continue to engage with India. Now more than ever, we need diplomats on the ground, and we need to talk to one another. Alors bonjour à tous, je suis avec mon collègue ici, le ministre de l'Immigration, Mark Miller. And Hello, the Minister of Immigration. Today we confirm that India has officially communicated its intention to universal, unilatera, unilater, laterally remove diplomatic immunity for all Canadian diplomats in India by tomorrow, except for 21 of them. This means that 41 Canadian diplomats and 42 dependents could have their diplomatic immunity withdrawn at some arbitrary date, putting their personal safety at risk. The safety and security of Canadians and diplomats is always our priority, given the implications of the Indian government's actions. We have made a decision to organize the departure of these 41 diplomats and their dependents in safety. Diplomatic immunity guarantees the safety of diplomats, regardless of their country of origin and the place where they are assigned. Immunity makes it possible for diplomats to do their work without fear of reprisals by the country in which they are posted. This is a fundamental principle of diplomacy. 
And those rules work properly only when all countries respect them. Unilateral revocation of diplomatic immunity and privileges is uh, contrary to international law, including the Vienna Convention. Threatening to do that is not only unreasonable, but escalatory. If we accept that this can be done, no diplomat on this earth will be safe. For that reason, Canada will not retaliate in the same manner. Canadians who are watching us today might be wondering what this means for our operations in India. There is no doubt that India's decision will have an impact on the level of service provided to Canadian citizens and Indian citizens. Unfortunately, we've had to interrupt in-person services and consulates in Chandigarh, Mumbai and Bangalore. I will let my colleague Mark Miller explain what impact that will have on immigration services regarding consular services. Canadians requiring consular assistance can always go to the High Commissioner's office in New Delhi. And you can, of course, always call or write to have your questions answered. Let's be clear. Canada will continue to defend international law, which applies to all countries, and we will continue to engage with India. Today, more than ever, we need diplomats on the ground, and we will continue the dialogue. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Melanie. First of all, I would like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. In 2022, for example, India was the top country for permanent residents, temporary foreign workers and international students in Canada. It goes without saying that we value the contributions of the Indian community in Canada and recognize the importance of Canada-Indian relations on families, business and pure people-to-people -people ties. Following India's intent to unilaterally remove immunities for all but 21 Canadian diplomats and dependents in Delhi by October 20th, 2023. Immigration, refugees and Citizenship Canada will be significantly reducing the number of Canadian employees in India. I want to reassure our clients in India and Canadians who have family and friends in India that Canada will continue to accept and process all temporary and permanent resident applications from India. Toutefois, cette réduction de personnel aura des répercussions à court terme et j'ose le penser à moyen terme. Mon département s'efforce. Medium term as well. Our department is uh, trying to mitigate the impact by adjusting the workload for centres that already process the majority of uh, applications from India. But some work will have to be done by email. Therefore, later processing and slower services are expected for applications from India. Clients uh, might see that their applications take longer to process and that their questions take longer to answer. It'll take longer to see a visa in their passports. ...to focus on the work that can't be moved out of the country, such as urgent cases, visa printing, and working with visa application centers and the panel physicians who conduct the important immigration medical exams for applicants. Our visa application centers are operated by third-party contractors, so they won't be impacted and will continue to function as normal. Um, applicants will still be able to receive administrative support, transmit passports, and submit their biometrics at one of our 10 centers in India. India isn't only the top country for permanent temporary residents, but their citizens have made great contributions to Canada, and that can't be understated. Newcomers from India have played a vital role, and we will continue to welcome them. I repeat that Indian citizens can continue applying to study in Canada, and designated uh, educational institutions in Canada will continue welcoming Indian students. New applications will be processed, but unfortunately, more slowly than before. Frustrations that this situation may cause for clients, families, educational institutions, communities, businesses, and Canada as a whole. However, we would like to assure everyone that Canada is determined to welcome all Indian citizens who wish to come here to visit the country, work, study, be with their loved ones, or make Canada their home. ...of our staff who have been heavily impacted by this around the world uh, and their tireless efforts to minimize the impact of the situation. Finally, just let me say that 
as ministers of the government, our primary role is to keep Canadians abroad safe uh, and f folks living in Canada safe, um, no matter what their race, color, creed, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you for your attention. I'll now open the floor for questions. On est impatient maintenant de prendre vos questions. Thank you, ministers. We'll go to the floor first for questions. One question, one follow-up. If you are online, if you could raise your hand at this time so I know how many questions we might be able to field from there, that would be great. And we'll begin with Valérie Michela. Um, Madame Jolie. Um. Ms. Jolie, how would you qualify what's happening, what India is doing? Do you find it unreasonable? Clearly. It's a reaction that isn't measured. It is also a reaction that is uh, in violation of international law and the Vienna Convention. That is why we will not retaliate in kind, because Canada is a country that applies its principles, principles applying to our own national sovereignty to the protection of our citizens, as well as the basic principles of international law. On a different topic, the francophonie. For my colleague Julie Dufresne, what do you think of the unhealthy climate of a dictatorship that in enquête is uh, uh, portrayed in a somewhat unsavory fashion? There are concerns, concerns that I've expressed to the Secretary General of the Office of Financial Institutions. That is why I wrote a, a letter to the Secretary General. And we have uh, reallocated part of the budget destined for the office, for, for the OFI to other functions. Their action of getting rid of diplomatic immunities to 41 of our diplomats, which is clearly contrary to international law. You're talking about people. Going. Canada looking to go there. Yeah, look, I, it's unfortunate. I think it's unfortunate foremost for the people that are, are looking to, to go to India. Um, we always want a diplomatic solution to these things. Again, I'm not the diplomat, but um, we, want, we won't compromise our principles at the same time. Follow up. How disruptive would you say that the uh, suspension of Canadian visas to India has been, specifically for your office, Mr. Miller? Well, we're hearing, obviously, stories of people that have spent money and have gone to a lot of expense to, to buy tickets, um, sometimes a trip of a lifetime. It, it, it's sad. Uh, it, it is not insignificant. So, uh, you know, we always want to make sure that uh, things are smoothing, fl flo flowing smoothly, but it obviously isn't the case. And, you know, we know enough about uh, the people that we deal with internationally to know how they behave, and some of it's predictable. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Ray. Bonjour. Quelle raison l'Inde vous... What reason did India give for this? Did they say clearly that this was associated with Mr. Trudeau's statement of September 18th? The Prime Minister was very clear. He stated in the House of Commons that we had information the allegations were credible, clearly, that a Canadian citizen had been murdered in Canada and that there might be a link with agents of the government of India. In the circumstances, we called on the Indian government to work with us on the investigation, to deal with it before the Prime Minister made that statement. A number of members of the government and the public service spoke with the government of India. They held, an, they held a number of discussions. So this was no surprise to the Indian government. Now the Indian government has decided to do what it is doing, which is in violation of international law, which puts at risk 41 diplomats. This is unprecedented. And if it were to be replicated in other countries, countries that may not have particularly good relations with us, but where there is diplomatic representation, that would endanger the diplomats in those countries. So it is very concerning. It does set a precedent, and that is why we have decided not to reciprocate in kind, because it is an unreasonable act. 
What reason did they give to declare 41 Canadians persona non grata? No good reason. No reason at all? No good reason. Did they give any reason? There is no reason under international law that would justify a country's withdrawal of diplomatic immunity in this way, overnight. And that includes the Vienna Convention. This is why I'm saying that it sets a precedent. Provided them specific information to back your claim. Uh, so, can you clarify? Have you shown them the evidence you're basing your claim on, and have you walked them through that case and shown them how Canada has reached this conclusion? We've had numerous conversations with um, India before the Prime Minister went in front of the House and made his declaration. This was not a surprise to the government of right, India. A surprise, but the evidence, did you show them and the evidence? through these different conversations, the uh, Indian officials were made aware of the credible allegations. And so based on that, um, India has um, decided to take their own decisions, which are precedent-setting, and revoking the diplomatic immunity of 41 diplomats is not only unprecedented, but also contrary to international law. And so in that sense, because this is so unprecedented and would put so many countries, different diplomats around the world in danger, we decide not to reciprocate. Okay, so that's a repetition of your statement, and thank you. I understand what your point is, but you're not answering the question directly on that point. But you did. But, Tonda, um, I've, ref I've answered your question. You've asked me the question whether we had conversation and presented evidence. If you evidence. showed them the evidence, I've yes. Shown, I've, dis I've, I've told you <coughs> that there were meetings and information was shared. So I I've answered your question. And so um, it's. In, in terms of the conversations that you've had and the talks that you've been having to stop this eventuality, um, it's happened over a number of weeks. Uh, it's been reported that you personally went to Washington and spoke to the Indian foreign minister, if you could confirm that to us. And can you describe what the tenor of right now, I know you're not going to talk about what exactly you said, but what is the tenor of the diplomatic conversation? Is it still ongoing or is it over now? Well, I always believe in diplomacy. And I di believe so much in diplomacy that I really think that diplomacy is best when it's kept private. So I will continue to do that. And uh, I know that my, my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, can count on me to make sure that we continue to engage. And I ask India's full cooperation. Raphael. Bonjour, Madame Jolie, sur Israël. Monsieur Lee, on Israel, have you seen the evidence provided by Israel on the explosion of at a hospital in Gaza? I've had that question asked of me in the House of Commons. My answer was very clear. What happened in Gaza? is absolutely dreadful. Palestinian civilians and Israeli civilians are equal, and both must be protected. The Prime Minister answered that question earlier today. He was clear Canada and its allies are discussing the issue at present, and Canada has a right to an answer. Uh, Jewish organizations have published a statement asking the government to retract and uh, to make a clear statement on this issue. Do you believe that perhaps by the end of this week the government might be able to reach a decision on where the rocket came from? I have answered that question. Jordan? Hi, Jordan Galling, CTV News. I'd just like to follow up on my colleagues' questions uh, in English. So U.S. and Israel intelligence are now saying the strike on the hospital earlier this week was not Israel. 
Um, are you satisfied with that as a government? And are you also, can you also respond to Jewish groups wanting you to retract or clarify your earlier comments on this event? So I've said it in the House, I've said it in French, I'll say it again, and this is my declaration. First, what happened in Gaza is completely devastating. And not only is it devastating, but we've been clear. Israeli lives and Palestinian lives are important. Israeli, uh, Israeli civilians and Palestinian civilians are equal and must be protected at all times. The Prime Minister has already mentioned uh, in his, you know, has already answered this question. There's been numerous conversations. Canada's in contact with all of its allies on this issue, and I understand that Canadians want an answer, and we will make sure to know what exactly happened. Okay, and just uh, my follow-up is regarding international aid uh, mm -hmm. getting through Rafa crossing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department, U.S. State Department said today that they're going to try and get American nationals out yeah. while that's happening. Is there any plan for Canada to do the same? See, every time I talk with uh, colleagues in the region, maybe Israelis, maybe the Palestinian Authority, maybe the U.S. and different levels of uh, uh, of uh, officials within the U.S. Um, Egypt, Jordan, uh, I always say the same thing. Yes, humanitarian aid must be going in. There must be a humanitarian corridor. We need to make sure that Canadians get out of Gaza. There's around 400 Canadians that are right now asking to be supported to get out of Gaza. And also, we are always calling for international hostages to be released. This is what I say and how I engage with every single government linked to this issue. I've had also conversations uh, with many Gulf states, including Qatar, on this issue. Tom Perry. Hi, Minister. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you accept India's numbers for the number of diplomats that they have here and that Canada has there. I think the Indians say that there are 62 Canadian diplomats in India, but only 21 uh, here in Canada. So do, do you accept those numbers? So we had 41. 41 have left. We have 21 that have left. Uh, uh, that, that have states, I'm sorry. So 41 that have left, 21 that have stayed. Uh, in India. Um, and what we don't accept is the fact that overnight, like this, India has decided to get rid of the diplomatic community. And having diplomats in a country without having diplomatic immunity given by that country puts their security at risk. And this is a risk that the government of Canada is not willing to take. We have a duty of care towards these diplomats, and we need to make sure that while they're serving our country abroad, that we're there for them. So that is why um, we will not reciprocate. So to your question, uh, we, won't, uh, we won't ask uh, uh, in India to get rid of its diplomats or we won't revoke any of their diplomatic immunity here in Canada. Okay, and you're not going to reciprocate. Is there going to be any kind of push, well, retaliation from Canada? Are you going to do anything in response to this beyond, I guess, what you're doing here, lodging a complaint? Well, um, two things. First, we called Persona non grata uh, a key official of India already. So we did that. Uh, following the Prime Minister's declaration in the House of Commons. Second, um, we've asked India for its full cooperation, linked to an investigation that is happening on, uh, linked to a m the murder of a Canadian here in Canada. This again is precedent setting. This again has never been seen. And so this is a fundamental violation of our sovereignty as a country. And so that's why we ask full cooperation from India. 
Dylan. Thanks for taking your questions. Just uh, looking for some clarity on the uh, threat around immunity that you got from India, if it was assigned to specific diplomats or if it was more of a quota that we're going to only give immunity to X number and you need to get X out. And just building on that question, just wondering what types, if it was about specific types of diplomats who work on political issues, who work on consular issues, if any of those were targeted, and, and who's left, if it's sort of a mix, if it's only political people, it's kind of a... Yeah. So Dylan, uh, your question will be better answered by the tech, through the tech briefing that is coming up afterwards. So... The threat that they... The, the, the you know, so, so I think, I think you'll be able to ask that question and, and get details. Huh. And um, could you just elaborate, what would full cooperation look like from India? In the context of the investigation, of course, uh, we need to make sure that they first um, uh, respect our national sovereignty here, and second, um, that uh, they provide support. So that's the only thing I can say at this point. And meanwhile, the Minister of Public Safety is working on this. And law enforcement, of course, agencies are working actively on the case. Thank you. We have a few minutes, so we're going to turn to questions online. Yeah. Um, again, to my online colleagues, if you'd like to raise a, have a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom, and then I will unmute you when it is time. And our first question will be from Dimitri from the Financial Times. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. India originally set a deadline of October, October 10. Obviously, you've gone 10 days beyond that. Does that suggest that in your conversations with the Indians or in the meeting that you had with Jai Shankar in Washington, did you get close to any kind of resolution or were you far apart the whole time? Uh, thank you, Dimitri, for your question. And I'll answer my, your question like I answered others here in the room is that, of course, I won't comment any diplomatic conversations. Um, and uh, I believe that diplomacy is always better when it's kept private. Do you have a follow-up, Dimitri? Go ahead. I know you can't get into the details, but can you give us any sense of was there any point where you thought you might resolve this? Or was it hopeless the whole time? See, Dimitri, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a door opener. I'm not a door closer. Uh, I'm a person that believes that engagement is always worth it. And I'll always continue to do that. And I'll always continue to talk with my colleagues around the world, including my Indian counterpart. Thank you. OK, that's all the questions we have online. Did any of my colleagues, we have time for one more question from the room. Dylan, go ahead. Yes, Dylan, go ahead. A uh, question about Azerbaijan. Uh, we still haven't laid any sanctions against officials in Azerbaijan. Uh, with Haiti, we did it alone at first. We were uh, a leader, as you've often said, in laying sanctions. But, but lately, your government's been saying we need to work with other countries. Uh, why are we not taking the same tack when it comes to Azerbaijan, given the possibility of ethnic cleansing, as Bob Ray said? So um, I've been clear on my and our position on uh, Azerbaijan, I will be coming, I will be going to Armenia in the coming weeks on, and we'll have more to say. As for Haiti. Um, no, but sanctions for Azerbaijan was the question. Yes, and I said already, you heard me, you even wrote about it, Dylan, everything was on the table. And we always say that all countries in the world need to respect the borders of their neighbors and their, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of their neighbors. That's the same for Armenia, and that's the same for Azerbaijan. But if you want me to talk about Haiti, I've been working a lot on the issue because of the CARICOM summit that was happening. And so... Uh, so you're watching Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie and Immigration Minister Mark Miller uh, explaining what they're seeing as an unprecedented situation in their relationship or deteriorating relationship with India. 41 Canadian diplomats uh, have left this after the country has ordered the Canadian diplomats to leave. Uh, this after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says that credible information, intelligence, says that India's government played a part in the murder of a Sikh citizen, Hardeep Singh Najjar, uh, in 
BC just a couple months ago. Jolie saying that Canada will not retaliate with this because she said this is already unprecedented and for Canada to respond to that would level that up. Uh, she was also asked numerous times if India has even been shown the evidence of this credible information that they're talking about. And she simply said that Indian officials were made aware of the allegations and information was shared. We're going to have a lot more reaction to this. Again, 41 Canadian diplomats have been ordered to leave India as the relationship between Canada and India continues to be on shaky ground.